brothers and sisters in Christ from St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Jonesville, Indiana, and all of our online guests. Once again, this is Pastor Young uh, bringing to you our study of the hymnal in the home where we study the Lutheran service book and how to use it as a devotional resource, um, not only uh, in the church, but also in our own family use in the home. And so today uh, we are going to be talking about the liturgy of the divine service. And before we really get into this in the hymnal, um, I want to just kind of talk briefly about the word liturgy. Now, sometimes the word liturgy um, is maybe misunderstood, maybe not, uh, maybe don't, people don't know what the word liturgy actually means. It's a churchy word. We don't use the word outside of the church. And so it might be helpful just to kind of go through the uh, etymology of the word. What does the word actually mean? Uh, the word liturgy comes from the Greek word liturgia, um, and as we see the Greek word up here, that might not mean much to you, and so through the magic of editing, I will transliterate this word into English, and we see the, the transliterated liturgia. We have two uh, Greek words essentially here. The one is laity, which essentially means person, um, and then we've got ergo, which means to work. And so in the word liturgy, what we are essentially saying here is that the liturgy is a work for the people. Uh, uh, we, we might call it a public work or a work, a public service, you might say. Uh, one person doing something that serves the masses. Um, and certainly that is the case with the liturgy. Now, the way the Greeks may have understood this word, uh, it might be similar to us having somebody that makes a significant donation to the library. All right, that, that donation, that generosity is there to benefit the public. Or somebody who fixes um, their broken sidewalk so that the kids don't crash when they're riding their bikes. Uh, even though the, the sidewalk is public property, each person maintains their portion of the sidewalk for the benefit of the people. Uh, and so that is kind of where the word liturgy gets its origin, uh, at, at least as far as Greek culture, that it is one person's work for the benefit of the public or the benefit of the people. Uh, in the liturgy, we have one person's work namely the Lord Jesus Christ, for the benefit of the public, for the people. Um, this is especially uh, pronounced in the German, as the Germans understood the divine service. They called it Gottesdienst, God's work or God's service. This is God's service to the people. And sometimes maybe this is helpful for us in our understanding of why we gather together in worship. Worship is not something primarily that we do for God, but rather it is primarily us receiving what God has done for us. Uh, but it is, it is a two-way arrow, right? We have, uh, we have God's service coming down to us. Certainly there is a downward arrow there, uh, but there is a response. Uh, there is us singing our praise and giving our thanksgiving to God. So it is not strictly God's gift to us. Uh, it is God's gift to us and then our response. And that is the way we have things arranged in the liturgy of the divine service. Uh, essentially, there's, a, there's this really nice balance here between the Lord giving us his gifts and then us responding in worship and praise. The Lord speaks, we listen. And then we say back to the Lord what he has first said to us. He gives, we receive. He provides, we respond in thanksgiving. Uh, sometimes when we go to a non-denominational service or a non-liturgical service, um, we might see a lot of our response in thanksgiving, and, and yet maybe there's something missing there, something empty that we don't exactly know what are we responding to? What are we thanking God for? Um, in the divine service, we have this beautiful balance here where God is giving to us and then we respond in that thanksgiving. And so maybe that is a helpful way to understand uh, the liturgy, the divine service. It is one man's work for the many, for the masses, 
uh, namely that one man, the Lord Jesus Christ, who pours out his, his word and sacrament for us to receive for the benefit of the many, okay? Um, in our liturgy, let's uh, just take a look at this in divine service. We'll start by looking at divine service setting one, and this is on page 151 in our hymnal. And the first thing uh, it might be helpful to know is that we have five services here uh, in our hymnal. We've got five settings of the divine service. Typically here at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Jonesville, Indiana, we use services one, three, and four, uh, and occasionally service five, although I'm not sure our people realize that. Um, so occasionally we will throw service five in there, especially um, on Reformation Day, because uh, Divine Service Setting Five is Martin Luther's German Mass, even though it's been translated into English. Uh, it is essentially the service that he had organized and said, this is the way we ought to worship. Um, and so on Reformation Sunday, that's kind of a fun one to do uh, in, in honor of Dr. Martin Luther. But in each of these services, even though they each have their own um, differences, their own uniqueness, uh, especially as far as tunes go, and even sometimes as far as the way things are said, there is consistency in what is said. Now, I want you to see that in each service, we have what are called ordinaries and propers. Ordinaries are the things that in the divine service are relatively consistent and necessary. We, we say them every week. They are always there. So for instance, the confession and absolution is always there. Uh, the Kyrie is always there. That is part of the ordinaries. Um, the creed is always there. We always speak the creed, whether it's the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed. We are saying the creed in every divine service. Um, you know, so we have those things that are consistent, that are um, necessary as part of our structure of the divine service. Uh, but then we also have what are called the propers, and I've listed those in green here. Um, the propers are things that are specifically appropriate to that particular Sunday. Uh, and so each Sunday we will have uh, the same ordinaries, but we will have different propers. And the propers include things like the collect for the day, uh, the prayer for the day that fits with the theme of the service, that fits with the readings. The readings are part of the propers for the day. And then certainly the hymns that we choose for that Sunday uh, can be uh, the propers, can be fitting with the propers for the day. Those are the things that change uh, service by service. And so this is kind of a, a nice thing built into the divine service, built into the liturgy, so that no Sunday is ever the same. Every Sunday, even though the message is consistent, uh, the, the God giving his gifts to you is consistent, how he gives those gifts and the words that we use in the giving of those gifts and the receiving of those gifts in the words of our readings, uh, certainly the sermon is different every Sunday. The words of our hymns are different. Uh, and so those propers uh, are unique to each specific Sunday for each specific occasion. Uh, this coming Sunday is the fourth Sunday in Easter. And so the fourth Sunday in Easter is always known as the Good Shepherd Sunday, the Sunday of the Good Shepherd. Um, and Therefore, our readings uh, from John chapter 10, talking about Jesus being the good shepherd, and then our hymns, the king of love, my shepherd is, I am Jesus, little lamb. These kinds of hymns really focus on that theme of Christ as our good shepherd, and those are proper to this particular Sunday. They are appropriate for this occasion of the good shepherd. And so that's the difference between the ordinaries and the propers. Um, and it does add, it, it, it allows for a nice variety within our worship from week to week. Uh, certainly using different services will add variety uh, to our service so that no service, even though we are saying essentially the same things, no service is ever alike. They're like snowflakes, right? Every service has its own unique characteristic to it and its own unique way of bringing God's gifts to you. Now we see in the ordinaries, there are, um, you know, we have the, the hymn of praise, 
the Gloria in Excelsis, or this is the feast. Um, and certainly other hymns can be substituted in for that, again, to add variety. Perhaps instead of singing, this is the feast one Sunday, you would sing, at the Lamb's high feast we sing. It would be just as appropriate and just as, uh, just as valuable to the service. There is a whole section in the back of our hymnal, um, uh, in the hymns section, there are the biblical canticles, first of all, that uh, you know can often be substituted for parts of our liturgy. For instance, instead of the nuke dimittis that is in the divine service, we could instead go back to hymn 937, Lord bid your servant go in peace, or 938, in peace and joy I now depart. Uh, those are all um, hymn versions of the Nuke Dimittis that we sing in the Divine Service. So those could be substituted as well. Um, all of those biblical canticles could work on just, just fine. Uh, and then we also have this section of liturgical music. Uh, these are specifically uh, hymns that can be substituted for parts of the liturgy. Hymn 946, Glory to God, we give you thanks and praise. Uh, we could sing that as our hymn of praise in the Divine Service, no problem. Um, so there are, uh, there are ways to substitute things in, to keep things fresh, to make things different and unique for each particular service. And that is kind of a nice way to add variety to our Sunday worship. There is certainly so much that we could say about each part of the liturgy and, and why we use these different parts of the liturgy. I do want to point out Again, looking at divine service setting one, that each part of the liturgy, each word we say, these are not our words. Each word comes from scripture, which means these are first God's word to us, and we are simply saying these words back to him. We are repeating what he has already told us. We are re, uh, repeating and echoing what God has already spoken to us. And so you see in each section of of the liturgy, we have a biblical reference. Uh, we begin our service in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And we do that because it reminds us of our baptism, our baptismal identity where we are baptized into that Trinitarian name. And we see that that is uh, coming from Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, where Jesus says, Go therefore into all nations, baptizing them, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So that is who we are. We are the people who bear God's name, and this worship service now is done in that holy name of the triune God. Um, everything has a scriptural reference. When we get to the Kyrie, Lord have mercy, from Mark chapter 10. Um, every time we say, Lord, have mercy, this is something that has already been said in Scripture. And we recognize in Scripture, every time people pray to the Lord for mercy, he grants it. We know that God will hear our prayers and give us the mercy that we seek. And then we have, certainly in the readings, we have a pronouncement of God's forgiveness. Uh, if that is not abundantly clear in the readings, the sermon brings that out, the sermon um, explains the forgiveness of God in Jesus Christ to you. And then if that's not abundantly clear, we say the Lord's Prayer. We pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And we know once again that when we pray those words, God hears those words and he answers them every time. We have confidence that our sins are forgiven in the name of Christ. And then if that weren't enough, we go to the Lord's Supper and we receive the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. And the pastor says, this is Christ's body given for you, for the forgiveness of all your sins. And so I think the nice thing about the divine service is that with all of these parts, all of these components, if you can make it through a divine service in the Lutheran church without having your sins forgiven, I'd like to know how you do it. Because it's all over the place from beginning to end. Everything is about God giving his forgiveness of sins, giving his gifts of grace to you, to you personally, so that you may hear them, you may receive them in your mouth, and you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so that is why we do the works of the, uh, the liturgy, why we, why we 
And so that is why we say the words of the liturgy, why we repeat the liturgy week after week, uh, Sunday after Sunday, because it is all about Christ giving his gifts to you. And that is what we need. We always need Christ's forgiveness to us. Now, there is something about this in this study, you know, when we talk about using the hymnal in the home, how do we use the divine service in the home? That, uh, that seems contradictory. The divine service is about God giving his gifts to you, and certainly he does that through the office of the pastor in the stead and by the command of his Lord Jesus Christ, giving you the forgiveness of sins and the absolution, giving you the forgiveness of sins in the Lord's Supper. This is not something that easily translates to the home. Uh, however, I would challenge you uh, to, to see this still as a tool to use within the home, uh, continue to teach your kids the words of the liturgy. Teach them the songs, the, the chanting of the liturgy. Uh, and it is amazing that put to music, kids pick this stuff up. They learn this stuff. I remember my wife had told me that when my daughter Lila, when, you know, who is now nine years old, when she was probably two or three years old, um, Ingrid was pushing her through the aisles at the grocery store, and Lila was... Uh, singing, singing her heart out in the grocery store. And, you know, it was kind of funny, kind of embarrassing, but, you know, she was singing, thank the Lord and sing his praise. Tell everyone what he has done. And she was just belting it out. And uh, there, there happened to be somebody in the next aisle who heard her and came over and said, I, I just had to see who was over here. I knew it was a Lutheran because I recognized those words. Uh, these are words that kids can learn and appreciate and love, uh, even at an early age. So uh, the first thing we do is bring our kids to church where they hear these words week after week. Uh, but we can also teach them to them in the home. Sing them with your kids in the home and uh, help them to memorize these words. Because these words are not just words of liturgy. These are the words of God. Uh, that are given to us. These are certainly based on those scriptural words that are that are given to us. And so there are ways to, uh, to use these in the home and certainly to encourage the use of them uh, in our daily lives, but also certainly in our Sunday morning worship. Go to church with your children, bring your families to church where they hear these words time and time again, and that these words uh, will form their faith. And so that is the divine service. Um, that's really all I can say about it in the time that we are given today. I hope you learned some things. I hope that it was meaningful to you. And we will see you next week as we continue talking about the other liturgies of the church, uh, namely the prayer offices, those services of prayer. And these can certainly be used and should certainly be used in the home. God's blessings. Have a good week.